Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's CMS web interface. CMS will provide an overview of the 2020 CMS web interface quality reporting for MIPS, ACOs, groups, and virtual groups. After the webinar, CMS will take as many questions as time allows. Now I will turn it over to Sandra to begin. Thank you, Haley. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today as groups virtual groups and ACOs prepare for CMS web interface quality reporting. I'm Sandra Adams Slaughter from CMS, an expert on the CMS web interface. Joining me on the call today are other experts who will share helpful information on CMS web interface quality reporting and answer your questions during the question and answer session after today's presentation. Today's call will only focus on 2020 quality reporting. Please note that any measure guidance provided during this presentation is specific to the CMS web interface. When using other collection types to submit data, you should refer to the measure specifications applicable to the collection type used. You can contact the Quality Payment Program Service Center with any of your questions regarding cost, promoting interoperability, improvement activities, MIPS, or quality reporting in general. Next slide, please. This is a disclaimer slide about the presentation. Information in this presentation is current at the time it is published, but I urge you to please be sure that you're using the source documents and links that are provided throughout the presentation. And please stay tuned to any communication from the Quality Payment Program, Shared Savings Program, or Next Generation ACO model regarding any updated information. Next slide, please. And next slide. The CMS web interface will close promptly at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on March 31st, 2021. Your submission will automatically be accepted at submission close. As a reminder, the CMS web interface is accessible using the sign-in link on the Quality Payment Program webpage, website circled here. Next slide, please. The materials from the January 27th and the February 10th support calls are posted on the Quality Payment Program webinar library. Next slide, please. The next support call will be held Wednesday, March 10th, 2021 from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Topics will include frequently asked measure questions regarding diabetes 2, um, hemoglobin A1C poor control, and mental health 1, depression remission at 12 months. Additional topics may be added prior to the support call. Next slide, please. Thank you. CMS Web Interface Application Programming Interface, API. Um, the 2020 CMS Web Interface API is available all year for testing in the developer preview environment. Please review the links listed here for more information. Next slide, please. So other CMS approved reason request must be submitted through the CMS web interface. Requests should be reserved for circumstances that are unique, unusual, and not covered by any of the denominator exclusions or denominator exceptions identified in the measure specifications. Please review the 2020 measure specifications thoroughly before submitting a request to skip a patient. 
And now I will hand um, things over to Katie Moore to go over frequently asked measure questions. Thank you, Sandra. Next slide, please. Okay, my name is Katie Moore from the PIMS team, and today I'm going to be going over some frequently asked measure questions. Next slide. The first measure we're going to be discussing today is PREV-10. So the intent of this measure is for patients aged 18 years and older to be screened for tobacco use one or more times within 24 months and receive tobacco cessation intervention if identified as a tobacco user. For the 2020 PREV-10 and use of telehealth, Screening for tobacco use may be completed during a telehealth encounter, as well as the tobacco cessation intervention. Your medical record documentation must include the date the screening was performed, the patient's tobacco use status, and if identified as a tobacco user, documentation of tobacco cessation intervention. Next slide, please. Here we have some frequently asked questions I will go over. Number one is, do we have to screen for both smoking tobacco and smokeless tobacco? The answer is no. If there's medical record documentation of any type of tobacco use status, the screening component of the measure is met. Question two, if we have a patient that states they're non-smoker or former smoker, is it acceptable to take since this is assessing a type of tobacco? The answer is yes. The intent of the measure is to, to determine if the patient was screened for tobacco use, a status for any type of tobacco use that is documented in the medical record, including non-smoker, former smoker, smokes, or uses smokeless tobacco, that all meets the requirement for the screening component of the numerator. Question three, who's able to complete the screening or cessation intervention within our organization? So can it be done by a medical assistant, nurse, or other healthcare provider, or does it specifically need to be a MIPS eligible clinician? Both the tobacco use screening and cessation counseling can be provided by anyone your organization considers qualified. Tobacco cessation intervention can be performed by another healthcare provider, Therefore, the tobacco use screening and tobacco cessation intervention don't need to be performed by the same clinician. Next slide, please. Are we allowed to use the tobacco screening from an urgent care or emergency department if it's the most recent screening found? The answer is yes. This measure isn't limited to a particular setting. Question five, what if the patient doesn't comply with the tobacco cessation? The PREV-10 measure doesn't measure patient compliance with the tobacco cessation as long as there's appropriate medical record documentation of the tobacco use screening and the results um, and the documentation of tobacco cessation intervention. If the patient is a tobacco user, the intent of the measure is met. Next slide, please. Now we'll go over PREV-13. So the intent of this measure is for patients at high risk of cardiovascular events to actively use or receive an order or prescription for statin therapy during the measurement period. In regard to the use of telehealth for PREV-13, the measure specification contains specific documentation um, stating statin therapy prescribed or being taken during the measurement period cannot be completed during a telehealth encounter. At the time the statin therapy for prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease measure was developed and finalized, CMS, along with the expert work group, believed it was important for clinicians and patients to have a face-to-face -face discussion in order to emphasize the importance of statin therapy and decrease the likelihood that a patient would refuse statin therapy. Therefore, telehealth encounters weren't allowed for numerator compliance. For purpose of meeting performance within the numerator of 2020 PREV 13, it is the responsibility of the group, virtual group, or ACO to ensure they can perform or complete and document all aspects of the quality action and ensure these quality actions are performed during encounters allowed within the measure specifications. This includes 
any part of a quality action that can't be captured during a telehealth encounter. Next slide, please. Okay, here's some frequently asked questions regarding PREV 13. Number one, is the list of statin medications within, or excuse me, is the list of statin medications within the measure specification considered all inclusive? The answer is no. The list of statins under the clinical recommendations isn't meant to be an all inclusive list of acceptable statins. There's guidance within the measure specification that states prescription of any statin therapy is acceptable. Both generic and brand name drugs are acceptable. It's important to note that the PREV coding document codes are all inclusive for purposes of mapping to an electronic health record, but you can use medical record documentation to meet the intent of the measure. Next slide, please. Question two, if a patient is on a combination drug, can we count the patient as being on a statin? The answer is yes, any statin therapy, whether generic or brand name, is acceptable to meet the intent of the measure. Question three, I understand that telehealth visits aren't acceptable, but if the patient sees a provider in the office, regardless of the reason, and the patient's current medication list was reviewed that include the statin, would this be accepted? The answer is yes. Within the specification, it states, in order to meet the measure, current statin therapy must be documented in the patient's current medication list or ordered during the measurement period. Question four, is documentation of hypercholesterolemia alone sufficient to confirm the patient is denominator eligible for population two in PREV 13? The answer is no. If hypercholesterolemia alone is present and there's no other documentation to support pure or familial, it wouldn't be appropriate to confirm the patient in the denominator of population two. On the contrary, if hypercholesterolemia is present in the medical record, along with documentation supporting pure or familial, it would be appropriate to confirm the patient in the denominator of population two. Next slide, please. Our last question, question five, when does the denominator exception, allergy or intolerance to statin medication need to be documented in the medical record? Medical record documentation should support that the denominator exclusion is active during the performance period and must be accompanied by an appropriate conditional reason why the patient isn't taking the drug. For instance, adverse effect, allergy, or intolerance to statin medication. For more specific information, please refer to page 17 within the PREP 13 measure specifications. Next slide, please. Okay, that brings us to the end of our frequently asked measure questions. I will go ahead and turn things back over to Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. These next few slides will outline the available CMS web interface resources. Next slide, please. Please note that 2020 materials providing information on MIPS quality performance category are available on the Quality Payment Program Resource Library. We encourage reviewing these resources if you have questions on quality requirements and measures. We'll continue to communicate any future postings and upcoming support calls. Additionally, the Health and Support page on the QPP website contains links to materials such as videos, webinars, and online courses, as well as other items to help with reporting and development. Next slide, slide please. And here are some additional resources for shared savings program and next generation ACOs. We encourage you to review the materials available here for more information. Next slide, please. If you need additional assistance, please refer to the contact information listed on this slide. Next slide, please. 
CMS has no cost resources and organizations to provide help to clinicians who are participating in the quality payment program. Learn more about technical assistance by following the links on this slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Help us to improve the quality payment program experience. Now, just before we head back into the Q&A portion of this call, if you are interested in providing feedback and collaborating with CMS on the quality payment program, we encourage you to participate in our human-centered design efforts. To get involved, please email your name, title, topic of interest, and organization to QPP user research at cms.hhs.gov. And now I will hand things over to Haley Burnside to begin the Q&A. Hey, great, thank you, Sandra. Um, we will now begin the question and answer portion of this webinar. Please submit your questions via the questions tab on your screen or raise your hand and we will unmute your line. Okay, and our first question is on CREV 13. Can you clarify the denominator exceptions for adverse effect and allergy? In the specification, I only see an explanation for intolerance. Also, does an exception trump a pass? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So um, the adverse effect would really be dependent on the patient and what is in their medical record based on their history of taking statins. Um, so in that case, we'd encourage you to maybe take a further look at the patient's medical record to determine if there is an adverse effect or allergy related to statin use. To address the second part of the question, um, does an exception trump a pass? Um, if you have a somebody who qualifies for a denominator exception, but they were prescribed a statin or meet the intent of the measure, um, that they would be included in your performance calculation. So um, it's really up to your determination. Um, it would be beneficial to include them if the measure was completed on them, um, but it is up to your discretion whether you would choose to report the exception or um, performance met in that case. Thank you. Okay, and our next question is also on CREV 13. If a provider states adverse effect is blank because of statin, does that count as an exception? Hi, this is Katie again. So um, yes, as we covered in um, the Q&A, you do need to show documentation of um, what that specific adverse effect is. So as long as your medical record documentation um, outlines that they had an adverse effect, potentially what it was, and due to the statins, um, that should be acceptable as outlined in the measure specs. Thank you. And our next question, why can't the documentation of statin therapy prescribed or being taken during the measurement period be completed during a telehealth encounter? Please explain. Hi, this is Katie again. So um, this is something um, that was just presented as well um, to go back and refer to. At the time the statin measure was developed and finalized, CMS along with the expert work group felt it was important for clinicians to have that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and that was to emphasize the importance of statin therapy and decrease the likelihood that the patient would refuse the statin. So um, the measure, as it's currently written, does require um, a face-to-face -face interaction with the patient and um, the telehealth cannot be used to complete the measure. Thank you. All right, thank you, Katie. Our next question is, if a patient refuses a statin but there is no documentation explaining the reason for refusal, can this be used as a denominator exception? So the answer to this question is no. There's no denominator exception for patient refusal to statin. Um, again, this measure 
isn't calculating patient compliance. Um, it is calculating based on patients who receive an order for statin therapy. So if that order is written and the patient doesn't pick it up, um, as long as the clinician is doing their due diligence in writing that order, um, regardless of whether the patient um, complies, it would be acceptable. Thank you. Okay, and our next question is on HTN2. If we find coding for central or primary hypertension, however, the clinical documentation in the patient's record only says hypertension, is this enough documentation to abstract yes denominator confirmation um, slash documented diagnosis of HTN? Hey, this is Carol. The measure requires confirmation of the essential um, hypertension diagnosis. So using a combination of written documentation, and an applicable code is acceptable as long as it supports that diagnosis. So um, I guess if you're having uh, questions about what type of hypertension it is, you can also um, follow up with the clinician um, and or look at the coding. Thank you, Carol. And our next question, if we have a patient in our measure who we have only seen for specialty care but not primary care, should we indicate that we are unable to find the record? This is Kristen from RTI. So patients sampled into the web interface had at least two primary care service visits with your ACO group or within your virtual group um, between January 1st, 2020 and October 30th, 2020. Um, so therefore your ACO group um, or group is considered accountable for the patient's care and you should do your best to obtain the necessary medical record information to complete the the web interface reporting. All right, thank you. Moving on to our next question. So if the patient says they don't smoke, you don't have to ask about smoke lists. The measure is tobacco screening to assess all tobacco use. That doesn't seem to be the intent. So oh, hey, this is Jamie. Thanks for sending in this question. I'm, I think it's, the intent of the measure is to determine if the patient was screened for tobacco use. So as long as the clinician has documented a status for any type of tobacco that's non-smoker smokes or uses smokeless tobacco that meets the performance requirement for the screening component of this numerator. Thanks. Our next question is on PREV5. If a patient is younger than 66 years but is on a ventilator, can I use that as a medical reason or do I need to ask for permission? Hi, this is Angie from Tim's. Um, since the patient's under 66, uh, they wouldn't meet any of the denominator exclusions, and there are no denominator exceptions for the PREP 5 measure. So you can submit a request for a CMS approved reason to skip. Um, and yes, so you would need to have that approved in order to skip that patient. Thank you. And our next question, if the provider documents that the patient is taking a statin but does not specify which is that acceptable documentation, sorry, is that acceptable documentation? Hi, this is Carol. Um, no, you would need to have documentation of the type of statin or what type of medication, I guess, has been um, prescribed to ensure that they are taking a statin to meet the intent of the measure. Thank you. Um, and our next question is on PREV13. When hypercholesterolemia is unspecified um, and is documented, what additional documentation besides familiar or peer would support hypercholesterolemia? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So um, we can't provide specific guidance on um, your patient's medical record. Um, we would just to go back to emphasizing that the measure specifications do um, require a diagnosis of pure or familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, one thing that we'd also suggest you could take a look at is the um, CMS web interface coding document for um, 
PrEP 12, or excuse me, PrEP 13, um, and take a look at, um, at the coding there to see what types of um, diagnosis would be included in the denominator. Thank you. And our next question, can atherosclerosis found in radiology report such a CT finding of atherosclerosis of aorta work for POP1? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So I believe this is another PREP13 question. Um, and this would also go back um, to taking a look at those coding documents. Um, so I'll also direct you to um, page 26 of the PREV-13 measure specification has a uh, downloadable resource mapping table. So this will provide the variable names um, that tie back to the appropriate diagnosis within the coding document. Um, so we'd encourage you to take a look at those to ensure um, that the denominator codes or descriptions listed there are applicable um, to the criteria for population one. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, and our next question is on um, colon screenings. Is, this, is a specific date of a colonoscopy in an office visit sufficient documentation? So basically patient reported. Hi, this is Angie, sorry. Um, Yes, as long as uh, there is a date, which at the, you would need the year at the very least, and the type of test and the results or finding is acceptable. Thank you. Great. And our next question, if there is documentation that the patient is not ready to quit smoking, does that count for cessation planning? Hi, this is Jamie. Yep, that would count for cessation counseling. Um, you've taken the effort to go ahead and screen that patient for tobacco use, so that totally counts. Thanks. Great, and our next question is on PREF 5. Is a month and year with results sufficient to meet the measure? Hi, this is Angie again. Um, you would the specifications say that you need the date and type of test and the results of finding. Um, the month and the year, at the very least, again, would be needed um, to support that the breast cancer screening was done during the 27 months prior to the end of the measurement period. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question is on PREV-10. If a patient refuses smoking cessation, does this still care providing cessation? Can you repeat that question just one more time? There's a little bit of a cutout. I just want to make sure I'm tracking the right question. Sure, sorry about that. Um, if a patient refuses smoking cessation, does this still count as the provider providing cessation? Yep, this, this still counts. Um, and just because you're you're doing that action of screening, so um, oh sorry, you are you are going you are um, providing smoking cessation for a patient that is screened as a yes for tobacco. So even if they choose not to participate in any cessation that you have offered or you have attempted to counsel, this would meet the numerator. Great. And our next question is a um, clinical question on PREV-10 and the question two that was reviewed today. Um, wouldn't the medical record have to indicate that the patient was screened for tobacco use versus um, uh, does the patient smoke? The response provided is saying it's okay to say the patient is a smoker. This is a bit confusing. Hi, Sandra. Thanks for submitting this question. Um, the medical record does have to reflect the actions that the clinician had with the patient, those interactions, um, as long as that medical documentation supports what is provided within the web interface, um, that would be sufficient. And please, if you still need more clarity, I just please open a, a quality, um, I'm sorry, a 
QPP Service Center Help Desk ticket, and we can go ahead and clear that up for you. Thanks. Okay, great. We will go ahead and move to the phone line. So, um, Zaylin Rodriguez, your line is now unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. And Zaylin, you may be self-muted. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we uh, completed our first upload using the sample file um, we submitted um, with an Excel file. Uh, but there are other practices that we are still manually collecting data. And I noticed that on the MHN1, I'm not able to go back and manually edit um, data on the WI. Laura, would someone from your team be able to address this question? Or hi, yes. Could you repeat the question? I I think I was not completely clear. Sure. Uh, so we did our first upload to the web interface with um, an Excel spreadsheet, but we also have um, a lot of community docs that we're still collecting um, data. So I've been able to enter the, the web interface and edit um, the data manually, except for MH1. That particular measure does not even give me an option to look up a patient. I'm going to have to ask you to submit a, a help desk ticket to the QPP Service Center. Um, and if you can provide screenshots in that and just ask them to direct that to the web interface product team, um, I can take a better look and see what you're seeing. Okay, so the web interface product team, because I have submitted a ticket, but they have not been able to um, give me a response. So I will yeah. ask You them. just respond to them and, and tell them, um, you should have an email chain, just respond to them and ask them to forward that case over to the web interface product team. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, and then um, Savannah Rittenhouse, your line is now unmuted. Savannah, your line may be self-muted. Okay, um, we will try to come back to Savannah. Um, so let's see, Heather Anderson, your line is now unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. Heather, yes, your line is unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, um, sorry about that, Heather. We will try to come back to you. Um, and just as a reminder for participants, um, if you would like to ask a question over the phone, please make sure to um, unmute your personal line so that we can hear you. Um, but we will go ahead and move on to Jacqueline Hopkins. Jacqueline, your line is now unmuted. Hey, so last, my question is um, in regards to CARE2. Um, last week on the call, um, it was mentioned that the measure requires a fall screening and the definition of a fall screening is an assessment of whether an individual has experienced a fall or problems with gait or balance. So I would like to know um, if the provider documents on his visit note that the gait is normal or the gait is within normal limits, Will that suffice for the measure? Thank you. Hi, this is Carol. I'm sorry if I misspoke, but um, a, uh, an assessment tool is not required for this measure. And yes, documentation um, surrounding, um, I guess, an evaluation of falls or future or the past falls or an immediate fall or assessment of such is acceptable. Does that help? 
Well, sort of, but um, a lot of our notes are saying, like in the review of systems, it'll say musculoskeletal uh, balance is normal, gait is normal. And I just want to know, without this, without a tool, will that count if it just says gait is normal? So that you may need to go back to your clinician about. We can't speak to your specific documentation to ensure that the assessment was completed or evaluation was completed. Okay. Okay, um, Belinda Dosick, your line is now unmuted. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My question is about PREV-10. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, it says that for tobacco cessation intervention, we should include brief counseling three minutes or less. How are we measuring three minutes or less? Does it have to have a timestamp where the counseling started and ended? Hi, this is Jamie. This is a, it's a good question. Um, there's no, we don't have a solid answer to this. The specification doesn't really indicate exactly how this would be captured or what would be seen within the medical record that would be approved. Um, so therefore the guidance that I could provide to you is, is, you know, if you guys are striving to hit that, you know, strive to get that brief counseling in and you're attempting to provide cessation and you're having that conversation, we're assuming that any period of time from zero minutes to three minutes, that's gonna meet that intent. Does that make sense? Because they're having that interaction and it's three minutes or less. So what if the record says that counseling offered, yes, but there is no other documentation in terms of what exactly happened, would that be appropriate? Can you say that one more time? So if in the record I found the documentation that it says that counseling was offered, but I don't have any other documentation in addition to that, would that be appropriate? Would that meet the measure? I'll leave this open to for others to jump in as well. I, we really can't speak to specific documentation. I can really only provide guidance on the intent of the measure. And the intent of the measure is that brief counseling is provided in order to meet the to meet that measure, that specific numerator. Um, so I, it really, it's, it's the interpretation that you're making in that chart based with all the other information that you're seeing. Other than that, those, I, again, I don't, I don't know how to respond to this just because I don't know and can't see the entirety of the, the medical record. Are there others on the call that would like to respond or provide any further guidance? You know, if you would like to still discuss this, you, I totally support you submitting a, a quality payment uh, program service center ticket and we can discuss it um, and try to get you a more clarifying answer as well. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And then um, Prathima Pichera, your line is now unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so my question is actually an extension of the question I posted earlier about um, if a patient refuses a statin and there is no you know, documentation explaining the reason or refusal, um, can this be used as a denominator exception? And, you know, I guess, you know, you guys answered saying that, um, you know, yes, we're not, you know, measuring the compliance or adherence, but what happens is when a patient refuses, the doctor might not write a prescription. So will the discussion or count or you know anything anything documentation of such, that sort would count for the numerator? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So the measure specification does require um, the actual order within the measure excuse me, then the medical record documentation. So if there was no order for the prescription, it would be considered performance not met for purposes of numerator compliance. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, and Stacy Aarons Wilson, your line is now unmuted. Hi, this is Stacy. Hi, Stacy. Can you hear me? Um, the question I had um, was for Prev 13 statin measure. Um, you shared on a previous call that hypercholesterolemia alone will not be appropriate to confirm the patient and the denominator for the population two. However, if you look at the um, CW, CWI PREV13 denominator, denominator code table, it has hypercholesterolemia disorder, SNOMED 13644009, which to me really contradicts what you're saying. Can you please explain that? Hi, this is Katie from the Penn team. So for this particular question, we would actually um, encourage you to submit that question to the QPP Service Center, either via email or um, to call the um, 1-866-288-8292 um, so that we can take a look at this a little bit closer um, and ensure that you're getting the appropriate response here. For uh, the purposes of the measure, it does require that diagnosis of pure or familial, um, but we'd want to take a closer look at the coding um, and just to ensure that we get you a full response. So um, again, just submit that ticket either via email um, or call the number to ensure you get a case number um, from, from the help desk and, and we can get you taken care of through that route. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, our next question comes from Shauna Karem. Shauna, your line is now unmuted. Shauna, um, your line is now unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. Um, we will try to come back to Shauna. Um, next up, we have Amanda Dunn. Amanda, your line is now unmuted. And Amanda, you may be self-muted. Okay, let's see here. Um, let's go to a question from our questions box. So, um, For the measures with the frailty exclusion, I need some clarification on the timing of different items. The frailty diagnosis must happen in the measurement period if they also have the one inpatient or two non-acute encounters with advanced illness during MP or prior year, does the advanced illness need to be documented during the qualifying encounter? It, or can all three items be completely un, uncorrelated, such as one, frailty at any time, to one inpatient or two non-acute encounters in MP or prior year, three advanced illness not in either encounter for number two, but documented in MP or prior year. Hi, this is Angie from BIMS. Um, I'm going to kind of go through this exclusion um, in the pieces, but Patient 66 years of age or older with at least one claim or encounter for frailty during the measurement period. That's the first portion of that exclusion. So you're going to have to find an encounter for frailty that is during the measurement period. Uh, the second piece is and either one acute inpatient encounter with a diagnosis of advanced illness or any combination of two encounters. And those types are outpatient observation emergency department or non-acute inpatient encounters on different dates of service that have an advanced illness diagnosis during the measurement year or the year prior to the measurement period. So the second half, um, you can have any combination of two of the advanced illness encounters and they need to be during the measurement period or the year prior. But the frailty encounter has to be during the measurement period. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank 
you. Um, and our next question is related to a hospice exclusion for a measure. Um, and a patient signed a DNR slash DNI and progress note states they would like to pursue hospice. We also found an order for um, palliative care consult. Would this suffice to exclude the patient? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So any medical record documentation of hospice or palliative care during uh, the performance period would be accepted. So in that case, um, yes, you should be able to um, pull them out of the measure as long as there's documentation of um, that palliative care during the measurement period. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. And our next question, if a provider documented CPT code G8483 for flu vaccination not administered and submitted through claims, does that meet the intent of the measure or does it need to state the reason it was not given? Hi, this is Carol. Um, yes, you would need to state the reason it was not given. Um, the medical record documentation would need to support um, the refusal and the exception or that the receipt occurred and that the receipt occurred during the appropriate flu season, which is August 2019 through March of 2020. Thank you. And our next question is on PREV 6. Does color guard testing in the measurement period meet the measure? Hi, this is Angie. Um, yes, um, the COLA guard does meet the intent of the measure if it's done during the measurement period. And as long as it is not um, an FOBT test that was performed in an office setting or performed on a sample collected via digital rectal exam or DRE. Thank you. All right. Um, and our next question is for PREV 5 and PREV 6. Does patient refusal or documentation of the patient declining screening count toward the numerator or either for either measure? Hi, this is Angie again. Um, no, there are no exclusions or denominator, denominator exceptions for patient refusal for these measures. You can submit a request for a CMS uh, approved reason to skip. And we suggest that you include all the documented details you have in the medical records, such as um, other screenings that may have been offered to the patient or the caregiver um, and all of the circumstances surrounding that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our next question is for PREP 13. Um, it was stated that as long as the clinician wrote the prescription and the patient refused to fill, we can count that. What if it is documented that the patient refused so the clinician doesn't even write the prescription? Hi, this is Katie. I think this one um, was maybe flagged. Uh, this is the same as a question. Uh, we had the caller on the phone, but just to reiterate, uh, there has to be that documentation that the prescription was ordered for the patient, even if the patient refuses to pick it up or take the medication. So if the prescription was not ordered, um, then it would be considered performance not met for purposes of PREP 13. Thank you. Okay. And our next question is on HTN. Would an orthostatic BP count for the measure? Um, hi, this is Carol. If it is the most recent blood pressure, you may use it. Okay, thank you. Um, and our next question, what do we do with patients listed as non-compliant with documentation of passive smoke exposure only? Hi, Winnie, this is Jamie. Thanks for this question. Um, I'm gonna try to break it down, but by all means, if you need more clarification, please submit another question through the, the chat or um, submit a help desk ticket and we'll, we'll get this answer for you. But the intent of the measure is just that screening is completed. If the patient is a user um, of any type of tobacco and that is documented in the medical record, then we would look to see if cessation was provided to that, that patient that uses the tobacco. 
So I hope that helps clarify, but by all means, please let me know if you need more clarification. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our next question, does blood, does blood pressure reading reported by patient during a telehealth or a telephone encounter meet the measure requirement? Hey, this is Carol. Yes, um, this measure does now include telehealth um, and it is not restricted to specific um, setting. Aside from not taking it at emergency visits and inpatients. Um, great, we have another uh, tobacco question. Um, and this person notes that they could only ask about chewing tobacco and put a status and never ask about smoking. Um, and that's just per the guidance that has been provided. Yep, this is Jamie. Thanks for the follow up question, Sean. Um, this is true. As long as you are screening your patients for any tobacco use, um, then chewing tobacco would count um, as a positive screen and we would recommend cessation even if there is no other capture of any other types of tobacco um, being used within the medical record. Great, thank you. And the next question is, if a patient has statin listed on their allergy list, is this enough to, um, to, quality for, to qualify for an exception? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team again. So um, although we cannot speak to whether specific medical record documentation would be accepted or not, the PREV 13 measure specification does outline um, that medical record documentation should support that the denominator exclusion is active during the performance period and must be accompanied by an appropriate conditional reason why the patient isn't taking the drug. Um, so as long as your documentation supports why that patient may not be taking the statin, it would be considered acceptable. Thank you. All right, thank you. And our next question is on PREV 13. Can you please clarify if a result in a radiology result but not in the provider notes, um, can I use that to confirm an ASCBD diagnosis? Hi, so any medical record documentation may be used to um, support the information you're reporting. So as long as you're able to support the diagnosis that you're reporting for the measure, it would be acceptable to use. Thank you. Okay. Great, we will go back to the phone line. So Heather Anderson, your line is now unmuted. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, good. Um, my question was about the PREV 5 and PREV 6 denominator exclusions. We had um, in an obstruction report from EPIC, I ha we had several patients that were excluded from PREV 5 and or PREV 6 due to um, going with me going through and looking them all up. Um, looks like it's because they had an ED or inpatient visit um, and it does, it did have a um, code for frailty and for, um, what was the other, advanced illness um, on, in their charts. However, my question is, they, they did, they also had had the screening because so far of the patients I've looked up, their um, frailty code and advanced illness code was, it's not a long-term thing. Um, and I had always understood that this exclusion was supposed to be to rule out those who had um, limited life expectancy and that type of thing. And these were just, they had a hypoxic respiratory failure event in the hospital and went home on O2 for a short period of time. Um, but that qualified them. So I'm just, can we, do we truly have to exclude them even though it was a short, a short issue and they did have the screening done? Hi, this is Angie. Um, if the patient meets the denominator exclusion criteria, all of it, 
then they do need to be excluded from the measure um, so that the intended population is included. Um, I realize you're saying it may be short term, but yet again, if they're meeting those denominator exclusion criteria, then you would exclude them even if the screening was performed. That is for exclusions. Now, if it was for a denominator exception, then you wouldn't necessarily have to take it if the test had been performed, but with exclusions, you do. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a limited life expectancy type issue in order for that exclusion to have to be used? Um, no, as long as they're 66 or older and they have the appropriate encounters and diagnoses okay. during the appropriate time periods, then you can exclude them. Or you should, you need to. <laughs> need to exclude them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and Diana Duarte, your line is now unmuted. Oh, hi, good afternoon. Um, I think I have, I, well, I have a question. I have a two part question about PREV 13. And I think it may have been like um, addressed a little bit, but here goes anyway. Um, in order to make in order to take the med the medical reason exclusion uh, the medical reasons exclusion, does uh, an allergy to statins, just statins alone, need to be listed in their list of allergies, or does an allergy slash intolerance to one or more statins noted in their record or on their allergy list suffice to meet the cr criteria? So, if, for example, if it says they're um, allergic to Crestor and or a, store, uh, a Lipitor, does that meet the criteria for a statin allergy or does it have to be listed as a stat, like a broad statins allergy, like a allergy to statins uh, in a broad sense? And then the second um, question I had also related to 13 is oftentimes the patient will be on a statin However, there is no atherosclerotic disease per se listed in their active diagnosis list. However, there'll be a, there will be a lab report that confirms that they have, um, there's results or findings that says they have atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic calcifications or other wording. Is that, does that suffice to meet the criteria, the qualification for the criteria for column CK, which is like the, fir the first um, question in PREV 13? Hi, so this is Katie from the PIMS team. Um, so to address the first part of your question, um, I would just like to reiterate, we can't comment on specific medical record documentation um, but just reiterate that you should have supporting documentation um, that the exclusion is active during the performance period and it must be accompanied by an appropriate conditional reason why the patient isn't taking the drug, which would be the adverse effect, allergy, or intolerance. Um, additionally, there is some um, additional guidance on page 17 within the measure specification. Um, it states when a drug allergy is found, um, look for the classification um, in the drug column of the denominator exception drug codes tab. These drugs may be used as denominator exception if present in the patient's medical record accompanied by an appropriate conditional reason why the patient isn't taking it. So we would need um, to see um, the statin allergy reflected in the medical record. Um, and if you have additional questions about that, I would absolutely encourage you to submit um, to QPP at cms.hhs.gov and we can take a, a look at that a little bit closer for you. In regard to your second question, um, any medical record documentation may be used to confirm um, the diagnosis for the measures. Um, so it, we would, I guess, as long as you have the appropriate medical record documentation to support a diagnosis um, for one of the um, 
patient populations um, it would be appropriate to use. Um, we would just need to see that reflected in your medical record, um, but the specifications don't dictate where in your medical record that information needs to specifically come from. Thank you, Katie. Um, and our next question, um, more raised hand comes from uh, Quinchi Villarica. Your line is now unmuted. Hi, I'm just, can you just clarify, I know someone asked in reference to the CARE 2 um, measure, because I reread the specs and they, it specifically said that you did not need a tool and that they can use the gait or balance. So if it's documented, gait is normal, will this be accepted? Yes, thank you for bringing that back up. Um, yes, it can be. Um, as long as you have medical record documentation that there was a screening, any type of screening, then that is acceptable. Okay, um, we will go back to um, some questions we received through the questions box. So, um, does blood pressure reading reported by patient during telehealth or a telephone encounter meet the measure requirement? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. Um, so a blood pressure taken by either a clinician or remote monitoring device, which is a home device or a device brought by a visiting nurse or caregiver and conveyed to the nurse or caregiver or by the patient to their clinician, it's acceptable for the numerator as long as it's the most recent blood pressure documented in the medical record for the patient. Since the measure guidance and specifications don't define what constitutes a remote monitoring device um, or methods of conveying the blood pressure from a remote monitoring device to the clinician, we're unable to provide guidance on the specific device or workflow um, regarding the use of remote monitoring devices during a telehealth encounter. One other thing uh, that I do want to just sort of reiterate from previous calls is that the definition of telehealth as it relates to the CMS web interface is a little bit more broad. So for new numerator compliance, a telehealth encounter may include medical record information obtained over the phone, email, or other electronic communication used to interact with a patient. If the quality action of the measure is captured during a telehealth encounter, you would need the medical record documentation to support what you've reported. Thank you. Our next question, what happens if a patient has a telehealth visit and no BP and it's the last of the year? Can you take the last in-person visit? Hey, this is Carol. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? Sure. What happens if a patient has a telehealth visit and no BP and it's the last of the year? Can you take the last in-person visit? So you're saying the, okay, so the last, the last visit, you would need to take the most recent visit or the last visit if that is the visit that was obtained because it can be from telehealth or from inpatient visits or in, in person visits. So you would want to take the most recent blood pressure documented within the measurement period. All right, thank you. Our next question, if there is a diagnosis of HTN but found it combined with other diagnosis um, such as diabetes, would it be acceptable for confirmation of HTN? Hi, this is Katie from the PIMS team. So the measure specifications do require a documented diagnosis of essential hypertension within the first six months of the measurement period or any time prior to the measurement period, but does not end before the start of the measurement period. So your medical record documentation would need to support a diagnosis of essential hypertension within the time frame outlined by the measure specifications. So you may need to go back and take another look at the patient's medical record to confirm whether or not that diagnosis um, would put them into the denominator. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, and our next question, 
What if the patient is on another medication for hypo, um, or sorry, hypercholesterolemia for PrEP 13 that is not a statin? For example, Tricor. Does it have to be a statin drug only to satisfy the measure? Hi. So, yes, only statins are acceptable for the measure. Um, other medications that are used to lower cholesterol are not appropriate to use for the measure. So it would need to be uh, statin therapy only, not other cholesterol-lowering medications. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. We will go back to the phone line, and Stephanie um, Tahara, your line is now unmuted. And Stephanie, you may be self-muted. Oh, so sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My apologies. Um, so my first, I actually have two questions. My first one is if there is a falls care plan um, or education for the patient regarding falls and balance uh, documented in the medical record, is this sufficient for meeting the care two requirements of the measure? Hi, this is Car Carol. So any, his, any documentation of a history of falls or I guess documentation related to gait and balance is acceptable for this measure. Um, so if it doesn't specify if the patient had a history of falls and just mentions like education for the patient and mentions balance, um, would we be able to still use that? So I can't speak specifically to your documentation. Um, mm -hmm and interpret that for you, but um, you may wanna take a look at page eight to look at the specifics for the documentation that is required, I guess, for this measure. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Okay, and our next question um, that we received to the inbox is on PREB6. If documentation in the medical record indicates that um, the date a colonoscopy was completed as uh, 2012 to 2013 and normal, is it appropriate to accept the later date of 2012 to satisfy the measure? Hi, can you repeat, repeat the question? The question? Sure, sure. So um, for PREP6, if documentation in the medical record indicates the date a colonoscopy was completed as 2012 through 2013 and normal, is it appropriate to accept the later date of 2012 to satisfy the measure? Hi, it's Angie. Sorry, I was um, speaking, but I'm not unmuted. Um, I'm not sure if if you were audited, if they had to make a choice between two dates. But because a colonoscopy is acceptable in the nine years prior to the measurement period or during the measurement period, uh, 2012 and 2013 are both within that time frame. So that would uh, pass the measure. Thank you. Um, and our next question is for HTN2. If we can't confirm CKD is stage five, is the patient a denominator exclusion? If you cannot confirm uh, the type of, of uh, CKD, then I would say they are, they are still okay to be submitted or reported. Um, you would need to determine if they actually have CKD in order to be to for them to meet an exclusion for that specific exclusion. CKD five specifically. Thank you. Um, and our next question is um, if blood pressure typed in by the is if blood pressure is typed in by the patient on my health, does it meet the measure? Okay, hi, this is Carol again. 
Um, so telehealth is included within this measure. Information can be obtained over the phone, email, all those fun routes. Um, so for the web interface for this particular measure, it's not limited to the Medicare billable encounters and telehealth is acceptable, so this would be acceptable. Okay, our next question is on PREB6. Um, is IFOBT the same as FOBT to meet the measure in the measurement period? Hi, this is Angie. Um, we really are supposed to have you consult with a clinician to determine if uh, the test meets the intent of the measure. Um, an immunochemical fecal occult blood test is an IFOBT and fecal occult blood tests um, are acceptable during the measurement period, but it is up to the organization to determine if the type of test meets the intent. Thank you. Great, and as a reminder um, to ask a question, please submit it in the questions box or raise your hand and we will unmute your line. Um, and Kitty, I believe you mentioned um, you'd like to clarify something for HTN2. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, so we're seeing a few questions come in um, regarding uh, blood pressure taken during the last visit of the year. And I just wanted to clarify that um, the measure specification requires the most recent blood pressure during the measurement period not that you have to take a blood pressure during every visit and document that one, but that you should be using the most recent blood pressure. So if there was no BP taken at the final visit of the year, you would go back and look for that most recent blood pressure value documented during the measurement period, regardless of visit type. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, and our next question that we received is on PREB 7. Um, can a practice chosen system reason if the practice ran out of flu shots to provide the patient? If so, will this have to be documented on the specific patient's progress note? Hi, this is Angie. Um, yes, patient level medical record documentation would be needed to support that. That was the reason that particular patient did not receive the influenza influenza immunization. Um, PREV7 documentation should be during the measurement period and be specific to the flu season being reported. Thank you. Okay, um, and then our next question is, um, HbA1c patient meets denominator exclusion criteria for dimension and meets measure requirements um, HbA1c below nine. Can we count the patient for the measured numerator? Hi, thanks Barbara for this question. I believe what you're indicating is that this patient's meeting a denominator exclusion. And in that instance, if your patient is meeting that exclusion, it just means that they're not really meeting the intended population for this measure, so I would exclude them. Thank you. And we do have a follow-up question regarding a recent response to blood pressure results via telehealth, um, and the use of a remote monitoring device has to be documented, correct? Hi, this is Katie. So um, here we would just encourage you to make sure that your medical record documentation supports the information that you're reporting within the CMS web interface. So um, we would just be looking for you to be able to support what you're reporting. Um, however, that is documented specifically is up to your organization and your internal workflow. Um, and we will move to the phone line. So, uh, Sandra Santagello, your line is now unmuted. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry to ask yet another question about the remote monitoring device and patient reported blood pressures, but I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So I totally understand that for telehealth, the patient can report um, 
But what about if it's an in-person office visit? So historically, if it was in person, the patient could not report their blood pressure. Is that still the case or is that removed? Is it for any situation the patient can report? That's my first question. Hi, so this is Katie from the PIMS team. So um, for HTN2, it does, the measure specification does say that patient reported, um, or re excuse me, blood pressure readings reported or taken by the member are not acceptable. Um, right. So in this instance, yes, if they're just coming into the office and saying my blood pressure was ABC, one, two, three, um, that wouldn't be acceptable. We would be looking for the clinician um, to actually take that person's blood pressure. Um, as it relates to telehealth and remote monitoring devices, um, there's a little bit of a different interaction there, but um, patient reported values are not appropriate. Thank you, Katie, for that. And my second question is, is just sort of a general question. I put it in the box, but I didn't see a response. So um, we have, you know, the issue in Texas where there was a public health emergency and um, disaster was, you know, declared, et cetera. So some folks are asking if, there's going to be any extension for the reporting in Texas. Is there anyone that can speak to that or guide me where we can find that information? Hi, this is Lisa Marie. And um, right now we don't have um, any information relative to extending, let's say, the, the reporting period for web interface users um, at, at this point. And right now, if there are issues and you feel you can contact the um, cloud payment program and, and submit a ticket and um, on the policy side we can address your, your concerns but as of right now we don't have any extensions for the web interface for for the reporting period thank you for that i appreciate it have a good day thanks you too Okay, and Shelly Simpson, your line is now unmuted. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. This is about PREV6. I, I understand that if the provider puts in the notes that the patient had a colonoscopy and the year and the results, it's acceptable. But if we're looking at a health maintenance flow sheet that lists those, and it typically has links, but in this case, it doesn't have a link, but it specifies colonoscopy completed, the date, and it even says next to it normal or no, you know, whatever. Is that acceptable on a health maintenance flow sheet? It obviously had to be input by someone at the practice, but it was not a provider, you know, themselves. It was, it was possibly an MA or whatever. So is that acceptable? Hi, this is Angie. Um, Jamie, jump in if I'm uh, not understanding this correctly, but if it's in the medical record at all, um, CMS doesn't dictate the, um, the uh, flow used you know, by practices. So it can be put into the medical record by anyone the practice field is qualified and would count. So if it's in the medical record, it can be used. Did that answer the question? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, our next question is, if um, a patient, patient is discharged from a hospital with home hospice care and is not in a grave condition, would this qualify to be excluded under hospice? Hi, this is Katie again. So, um, what we'd really just be looking for is um, the patient being in hospice care at any time during the measurement period. Um, so in that case, if the um, the patient was in hospice care, excuse me, hospice care, you would um, be able to report not qualified for sample as long as your medical record documentation um, supports that. Thank you. Great. Um, 
and I believe we may have time for just a couple more questions. So um, our next question is, for a patient who has a pacemaker and has been told by their cardiologist to not have a mammogram due to their pacemaker displacement, um, is this an exclusion or exception? Hi, this is Angie. Um, there is no exclusion or exception in the measure for that. Uh, the, you could, uh, I'm sorry, request ACMS proved reason to skip. And again, be sure and include um, anything, any other type of screening that might have been offered to the patient and all of the details that you have in the medical record uh, regarding that situation and then submit the request. Thank you. Um, I believe we have time for one more question, and I think um, this is a, um, a couple questions in one. So regarding the exclusions for frail frailty and advanced illness, I can find them in the claims data, but do, I do not necessarily have the office note. Would claim be sufficient? Hi, this is Angie. Again, um, no claims data alone um, cannot be used. Uh, cannot substantiate that, but if you have um, the claims data can be used to find the correct medical record documentation, and you would need medical record documentation to support as well as um, the claim. Thank you. Or I should say, I'm sorry, one or the other. Um, I'm sorry. What, you, you must have the documentation in the medical record. The claim can help you find that that documentation, but the claim alone cannot be used. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Well, I believe that is all the time that we have for today. Um, and just as a reminder, these support calls will continue every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time through March 24th. Um, so thank you all for joining this afternoon.